Okay, let's see. So welcome to the Wednesday night webinar. It's going to be a fantastic evening. Paleoclimatology with Ben. Um, so I hope that you uh, have all topped up your drinks and are cozy because it's going to be one of those evenings you're not going to want to leave your seat. So um, we're just going to let everybody pop in as they're, they're coming along here. We've got quite a crowd, so which is great. There's nothing better to do on a Wednesday night than to stay with us, Surrey Wildlife Trust. Um, for some of you, this might be your first adventure with us. Some of the names I recognize that you've been here before. Um, and let's see, it is seven o'clock now, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Sue O'Regan, and Emma Rothwell and I are going to be hosting the evening for you. Um, basically, we're going to make sure that everything runs smoothly so that Ben can have a fantastic evening. Uh, for those of you who have not been to a webinar before, just to let you know, on the bottom of your screen, there's a, a, a few things that you should know about. During the presentation, um, if something pops into your mind that you want to ask Ben at the end of the evening, the Q&A section, just type that in, and afterwards, Emma is going to ask all of those questions to Ben. Next to it, um, you're going to see a chat function. That is only seen by Emma and I, so that's if you have a technical problem or you need us to know something and we can respond directly back to you there. Um, everybody's um, gonna be on mute for the, for the duration. This is being recorded, so um, if you want to share this with other people in the future, it'll be fantastic. Um, let's see, so um, other than that, if you're ready, we're gonna, I'm gonna hand you over to Ben, enjoy the evening. Hi, thank you, Sue. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ben, as Sue pointed out. Um, I work for the Surrey Wildlife Trust as an education officer and also as a GIS analyst. So I have quite a few different hats on and some of you might have seen me doing various other things. Um, but tonight I'm kind of putting my university hat back on. Um, with uh, in regards to climate science. So I spent a lot of my undergraduate and master's degree um, studying environmental change. And in particular, I was really interested in the, the past and deep time and how our climate and how our ecosystems have really changed over millions and billions of years rather than the modern stuff. I mean, obviously the modern stuff is great too, but it's, I think some of the paleo stuff is really, really interesting, which is why I'm here today to talk to you about all of that. So um, bear with me one second while I just get all the screen sharing going on and then we can get going. Sue and or Emma, can you tell me if that's all correct? That's perfect, Ben. Perfect. Okay. Because I do often mess that bit up. Right. Okay. So here we go. Hopefully everything's going to work. Wait, I've lost my screen. One second. <laughs> okay, cool. So paleoclimatology. Yeah, I've already introduced myself so we can just get started. So what actually is paleoclimatology is kind of where we're going to start with. Um, so it might be a word that you haven't come across before, but it, if you break it down, it's just paleo and climate. So paleo obviously refers to ancient things. So paleontology is the study of dinosaurs and prehistoric animals. Uh, paleo like ecology is the study of past environments and past ecosystems. So paleoclimatology is just about the study of ancient climates. And more specifically, it's about climates for which we couldn't take direct measurements. So anything before we invented scientific instruments like thermometers to actually record and measure the climate ourselves. So actually, that means in that definition, the paleoclimate actually goes right up to about 1850 when we started inventing some of these things. But, you know, mostly when we're talking about paleoclimates, we're talking about millions and millions of years ago. So um, then what did they do when they didn't have these scientific instruments to measure things? So mostly they were reliant on things called proxies instead of these direct measurements. And what a proxy is, it's just a substitute that you can then make sensible inferences and estimation from. So. Um, these are very often biological, the idea being that if you found a creature, the remains of that creature from a certain time, 
the habitat preferences, the environmental preferences of that creature would give you an idea of what the environment was like at that point in time. So if it was you found the remains of a dinosaur that did really well in hot, dry climates, then you could probably assume the climates um, around the time that it died were hot and dry if there was lots of them around. So that's the kind of what side. And then we have the when side. How do we know when we're talking about? So most of the time we're having to use dating techniques. So you date the rocks that the fossils were found in, and we'll go into a bit more detail about all of those different things later. But that's kind of the gist of it. We're looking at climates from a really long time ago, and we have to use other methods to find out about them because we don't have any thermometers or data, direct data, to tell us about them. We're having to use inferences based on fossils, really, and other kind of older biological and chemical things. Um, it's kind of all based around this principle called uniformitarianism. And that's kind of what the name of the talk was. It's about the past being the key to the present. It's the assumption that the same natural laws and processes have existed for the entirety of time and will exist in the future as well. So all of those natural laws in science that govern our our current modern world were also true a million years ago or a billion years ago and they will still continue to be true for millions and billions of years as well because that's they're kind of just the the core parts of how science works they're not going to change so because those processes have been uniform throughout time we that's why we can make these assumptions about habitat preferences and how that relates to climate and things like that and what that really helps us to understand the point of doing all this is so that we can understand better how the Earth's climate behaves and what counts as natural and what is actually outside of natural, because obviously that's of great interest to the scientific community and politicians and everyone really at the moment. So we're going to um, sort of begin by delving into in more detail how we actually find out all of this information about past climates and then we're going to look a bit more about why do we want to know about them and then um, a few other interesting bits and pieces as well so we'll start with this one so a lot of what we know about um, past climates comes from sediment cores and ice cores so these um, exist you know, we've used them for a variety of things around the world. Sediment cores usually come from lakes or oceans, whereas the ice cores are coming mainly from the ice sheets at the North Pole and the South Pole. So they were this whole principle of taking these cores is to do with the idea of superposition, the idea that the rock lower down is going to be older than the rock higher up. So if you think about it, at the bottom of an ocean as sediment gets deposited the newer sediment is going to form layers on top of the older sediment and at the north pole for example as the snow falls the the snow and the ice at the top will be newer than the snow and the ice at the bottom so basically by putting a big tube into the ground and then you get this really really long core and the longest ones from antarctica are like three kilometers long you can then look all the way along the core and see the different layers. Sometimes they have annual layers. You can see right down in the fine detail each year of snow deposition or each year of sediment deposition. And by looking at that, you can um, obviously have a really, really detailed dated record of the climate. So um, it's, yeah, these records take us back a really, really long way. So like I mentioned, the one that's three kilometers long in the South Pole does about 800,000 years of climate history. And the sediment cores are really good as well, but usually they don't go back quite that far because obviously sediments at the bottom of the ocean do eventually get lost with tectonic processes and things like that. Whereas the ice cores have been quite, uh, they're where they are has been quite stable for a, for a long period of geological time. So just as well before we move on i talked about the annual layers of these being how they how they're dated because we're really lucky in these instances that we can literally look at each individual layer and be able to count back the years from the surface obviously there's other dating techniques that we have to use as well so radiocarbon dating or carbon dating is one most people have heard of and that's really great. That one works for up to about 60,000 years ago, but there's all different types of dating techniques that are all kind of specialized for looking at certain periods of time. So for example, lead 210 dating is used um, in modern sediments. Uh, it works really well there, but for things um, in quite deep time, hundreds of thousands of years ago, we're usually things like uranium or potassium dating. So there's a big range of different elements that people use in the dating. It's not just carbon. So. Um, just interesting to know that really. So 
in terms of what we actually find out in the ice cores then so i mentioned earlier lots of the indicators we look for are biological but obviously there's non-biological ones as well there are loads and loads and loads of these and we're not going to cover them in too much detail but we're just looking at kind of two examples of some of the most common ones obviously we've talked a little bit about ice cores already but there are other ones as well that we're just going to touch on briefly so for example like I mentioned before, you've got you've gone to the North Pole, you've dug down into the ground, and you've got a really long three kilometer long ice core. Great, you can count back the layers, count back the years so you can date it, but then what are you actually looking for in that ice? So there's a few different things that tell us different pieces of information. So for example, you could get really lucky and you could find actual air bubbles trapped in the ice and that would literally contain atmosphere from that point in time so that could be atmosphere from hundreds of thousands of years ago and obviously then directly from that you can look at how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere how much oxygen was in the atmosphere and from that make um, create you know graphs of what the temperature was doing at that time you can also find dust in ice cores which is a good indicator of cooler drier periods um, the depth of the layers themselves is obviously going to be related to how much precipitation fell in that year. So obviously a thicker layer could be a wetter year. And then also they have um, oxygen isotopes within them as well that we can create, use uh, to create very detailed rainfall and temperature records. So obviously because they're made up of water, H2O has oxygen in it and oxygen um, has oxygen 18 and oxygen 16 isotopes which i won't go into the whole confusingness of how that works but basically the ratio between them is dictated by temperature so they will look at how that ratio changes in the oxygen that makes up the ice over the years and be able to really really find finally map out how the temperatures changed over that time although they are limited globally obviously to the poles We've got we've got the really deep one, like I mentioned, the three three kilometer one from the South Pole. But they've also done um, things on the sort of Arctic ice sheet as well. And actually, the temperature reconstructions from both of them match up very cleanly. So it gives us that um, you know kind of reassurance that the science is working because two opposite ends of the globe we're getting the same pattern. Uh, the other thing on this slide is a speleothem. That's a kind of fancy name for a stalactite or a stalagmite. And obviously these are helpful because your ice cores are spatially limited to places where there are ice, whereas speleothem, speleothems are terrestrial things and they form in caves. So again, these, these aren't able to go back quite as far as the ice cores, but they can, they can do a good chunk of time. And you're again, kind of looking at layers, you're looking at as the minerals precipitate and form a new layer of your stalactite or your stalagmite, you'll see it grow incrementally. And you can look back through those layers and look at the chemical composition of the minerals that make it up. So a lot of the time it's things like calcium carbonate. So again, you can look at the oxygen, just like we did with the ice cores. And you can also look at the carbon part of that. And that would tell you information about how much vegetation there was, because obviously um, the more vegetation, perhaps the more carbon is um, taken in by that through photosynthesis. So moving on to biological indicators, which admittedly are the ones I find much more interesting. And the list of them is very, very long as well. And even the ones I've got on this slide here is an exhaustive list. So we're gonna cover a handful of the more commonly used ones, um, but there, there are obviously lots on that list that we're not going to touch on. So if it's something that interests you, I'd recommend having a look into some of them because um, it's really, really interesting how they all work. But like we talked about before, the general principle behind this is that the presence of a species of animal or plant is just going to indicate to us what the climate was like at that time because of the preferences of that species. And we know that scientists, even back in ancient Greece, were using this kind of logic where they found, for example, marine fossils in inland areas, and they were able to deduce, deduce that there were oceans there in previous times. A kind of classic example of this is um, the fact that marine fossils are found at the top of Himalayas, the Himalayas, and that's because the Himalayas actually used to be at the bottom of an ocean called the Sea of Tethys. So the fact that people are finding marine fossils up there obviously tells us that um, what that environment used to be like a very long time ago and has definitely caused a fair bit of confusion for different people over time. So moving on to the first one we're going to talk about, um, pollen is one of the most widely used of the biological indicators. It's um, even got its own little branch of science called palynology. Um, 
so it's one of the main techniques used for vegetation, obviously, because vegetation is the thing that produces pollen. And it has really shaped our understanding of how vegetation has behaved in the last couple of million years, because it's really, really good as an indicator for a variety of reasons. So first of all, the walls of pollen uh, is made up of something called sporopollenin, which is really, really resistant to degradation, which means then it preserves really, really well in the sediments and therefore has you know, persisted millions of years so that when we dig it up, it's still very nicely preserved and we can identify it. It's obviously produced in huge quantities because plants just make loads and loads and loads of pollen. So the fact that there is so much of it produced means there's a very good chance that a lot of it will then be preserved just because there's so much of it. And then the other thing is because the um, shape of the pollen um, is usually related to its function. So for example, wind dispersed ones will look a certain way. It makes them very distinctive from one another and very easy to identify. So obviously that's a big tick in why they're useful as well. So they preserve well, there's loads of them and they're easy to identify. Fantastic you know, set of characteristics for something that works well as an indicator. They've told us a lot about all kinds of different things. It's not just what the vegetation itself is doing, but pollen has been used to help us look at what humans have done as well. So our impacts on vegetation. So they've been used to look at the spread of agriculture, the spread of invasive species, the impact of wildfires and things like that, because obviously, you know, the agricultural plants produce pollen as well. So there's a huge, you know, huge variety of things it can be used for. There are a couple of limitations with it. Um, the main one being that because there is so much of it and it disperses so far, there's sometimes a lack of clarity between whether the presence of a small amount of pollen could mean a local population that was just quite small, or it could be representative of a more distant population that was just really, really big and produced so much pollen and it got carried a long way. So there are things like that just because there is so much pollen and it does spread a very long way from the source of it. Um, there has been sort of some confusion in different studies over time. So the kind of answer to that is another technique, which is very, very complementary to pollen. So macrofossils are anything that is small enough that you can identify it with a microscope, but you can still see it with your naked eye pretty much. So included in that group are things like plant seeds, maybe leaf remnants, um, bits of invertebrates like beetle wing cases and things like that. So the ones on the slide over here, there's a couple of um, seeds from aquatic plants down the bottom and there's a couple of invertebrate bits and pieces up the top there. So these work um, in a complementary way to pollen because they're kind of the opposite. There's not very many of them and they're produced very locally. So they will only be near where the source of them is. And generally they also fill in that little gap that pollen misses because macrofossils can be preserved for plants that don't produce pollen. So lots of aquatic plants don't produce pollen, but they then get representation through macrofossils. So it's helping to fill in the little gaps that pollen's missing out. The, um, the complementary nature then comes into play because like I mentioned in that example, if we have the small amount of pollen, do we know if it's local or if it's just far away? If the macrofossils for that species are also present, you can then find out if it's a local species or not. So for example, if there's a small amount of pollen and then the macrofossil for that species is present as well, you know that the pollen is from that location. You know it just hasn't blown in from further away. And that's been the macrofossils in this case have been used to correct actually a lot of past work that was done just on pollen representation. So there's a kind of moral of the story here that although there's lots of different techniques, the best reconstruction of the climate will be by using them together where possible. You're not you know, pitting one against the other. All of them have pros and cons and you would get the best possible outcome by using as many different techniques as you can and focusing on the strengths of each one to complement the weaknesses of the others. So um, the next one is a really interesting group of microscopic algae called diatoms. They're an enormously successful group, and there's, we think, at least 2 million species around the globe. There's probably way more than that that we haven't discovered. They're an enormously successful group, 
And with that many species, they really coat the entire globe and they're present in every single freshwater habitat. And in fact, they're present in basically anywhere there is water, even wet soil and things like that. So they're absolutely everywhere. There's loads of different species and they've existed really prominently in our fossil record since the Jurassic period. So again, all of those things, you know, make, make for a great biological indicator. The other reason that they are great is because just like the pollen, they preserve very well. So they use um, silica in their cell walls, which is quite strange for a, an organic um, thing, but it basically means that their remains are glass. So they leave behind glass and you can see the sort of delicate, intricate structures that get left behind in that picture there. And um, because they come in this huge variety of shapes and sizes, they are very easy to identify as well, thanks to the sort of intricate glass prints that they've left behind in sediments and rocks. The sort of crucial part to them is because there are so many millions of species, you know, almost by default, they are very specialized to different environmental conditions. So what that means is if you find um, you're looking in your sediment core and you're looking at your diatoms that are there, you can infer very, very detailed um, things about what the climate was like at that time, just because certain species will have very, very specific preferences about what they like. So by having a look across the entire assemblage of diatoms that's there, you can reconstruct water temperature, salinity, nutrients, sea ice cover, pH. There's absolutely sort of no end to the things that they can indicate rather than just indicating, oh, present, absent, it was probably a bit warm at this time. They can tell us very, very, very fine detail about what conditions were like. So um, I think the last of the major biological indicators we're going to talk about in detail are the ostracods. So these, these are a bit bigger in scale and these can be seen with the naked eye. And actually they are present in most freshwater. And if you've ever gone pond dipping, you've probably seen them, but not realized what they were because they kind of just look like small poppy seeds in the water that move around. And um, they're actually crustaceans. They're just very small crustaceans. So they're related to crabs and things like that. And they produce a shell for themselves made of calcium carbonate. And you can see them in this picture here looking like little baked beans. So they exist sort of inside a closed shell and then they have little tentacles and um, little feelers that they stick out to help them filter feed. So again, they are really, really valuable indicators because they're really abundant in the fossil record. So that, yeah, like they're the most um, abundant arthropod in the fossil record. And there's about 65,000 species that we know of. And, and they've existed for 450 million years. So they go back quite a, a long way compared to the diatoms. They're going back to even before the beginning of the Triassic period and well before that, almost to the beginning of when um, complex life begins to evolve in the ocean. So they coat pretty much almost you know the entirety of the fossil period where you know we can even find fossils they're there for most of that so they're really really good for the real deep time stuff again they have this calcium based shell calcium just like our bones great thing for preservation preserves really well in sediments and because they molt their shell throughout their lives, they're kind of constantly producing more and more shells that get left behind in the sediment at the bottom of the ocean or wherever abouts they are. So there's plenty of material to uh, get preserved and then provide evidence of them when these rocks are digged up, dug up however many years later. They, um, again, like everything else, they have their preferences. They're particularly good for looking at water temperature. Um, but they do have a couple of sort of caveats with them because, because they, um, they're not as easy to distinguish as the diatoms. They look a bit more similar to each other. And because they're molting throughout their life, they have lots of different size shells in the individual. And the individuals can vary quite a lot as well. So that, you know, they're sexually dimorphic. So the males look different from the females. And it's not uncommon for them to have asymmetry between the two halves of their shell. So the species ID with them isn't quite as straightforward, but it doesn't mean that we don't use them because especially for that older time period, they're really the, one of the only things that exist for a long window of you know about 200 million years. They're, they're the only ones. So just before we move on from all of our indicators, a bit of a, I guess, a little bit of a again, a little bit of a look into the science that they actually get used in. So 
there are these things called transfer functions, which are a technique to quantitative, quantitatively reconstruct chemical variables based on the biological community that's there. So that's a really useful thing because whilst so far we've mainly been talking about assumptions and assuming a climate was a certain way because of the animal that was there, if we can translate that into actual values of pH or actual values of temperature, then that is what is really, really good evidence for looking at how things have changed over time. So the way these work is that you, for the diatoms are one of the most commonly used groups with this technique, because like I mentioned before, they have such specialism. So you'd go and look at a modern assemblage of diatoms, you'd measure the water that they were in, and you'd find out which ones liked which pH, for example, what, what level of acidity did they like in the water? And that would help you create what you'd call a training set. You'd then go and look at your diatoms from a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, and based on the animals or well, the diatoms that were present there, you could then translate those pH values to that community as well to give yourself an idea of what the pH value was like and what that community was representing. So this has been um, quite widely used since the technique was invented. And it was really important in the UK for looking at freshwater acidification in the late 20th century. So um, the diatoms in sort of the lakes up in Northern Scotland were compared to the diatoms in lakes that had undergone um, acidification due to the acid rain. And it was quite they were really instrumental in definitively proving that actually waters were getting more acidic and maybe the government needed to do something about the cut sort of nitrogen emissions coming out of um, factories and stuff like that. So, and what have we found out from all of this? What was the point of doing all of this? So it, it is a long story and we'll be on this slide for a while because there's a lot going on. It's quite uh, complicated, but in the last 30 years, which is really how long paleoclimatology has been properly going on for, we've worked out all of this. This whole graph has been worked out dating right back to the Cambrian explosion 540 million years ago. So the reason that that is a good starting point was because for some reason at that point, there was a massive evolutionary explosion and organisms moved from being single celled things to multi celled things and then more complex things like invertebrates, arthropods down at the bottom of the ocean, evolving into all kinds of weird and wonderful things. So the Cambrian explosion really is the beginning of the fossil record for a lot of things because prior to that, it's mostly single celled organisms with no kind of solid body parts that would preserve well in sediments. So our fossil record really goes back to the Cambrian explosion. So therefore a lot of our reconstruction is most confident up until that point. So we'll go, we'll have a look at the graph first of all with all these lines on it. So what's important to note is that there are different scales along the bottom. So the orange bit has a scale of hundred million years at a time. The green bit's got a scale of 10 million years at a time. And then it gets finer and finer and finer as you move along right down to this one, which I think is just in five, you know, 5,000 years at a time. So it, it's obviously if you had it all in the same scale, it would be massively stretched out compared to that. So um, we'll start right down this end and we'll just go along and have a look at some of the key events that are happening as we move along um, our graph. So this whole orange section covers about 450 million years and it encompasses the two main eras. So we've got the Paleozoic era, which is the first bit basically, and the Mesozoic era. No, sorry, ignore that. So the Paleozoic era is the whole orange bit and then the Mesozoic era is the green bit. So don't worry about that too much for now. But the, um, no, sorry, I was right the first time. The Mesozoic era is just the end bit of the orange there where the dinosaurs were alive for the Triassic, the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but um, I might be able to, I'm not sure. Well, I hope you can anyway. So if we move along our line, we start off right here at the Cambrian explosion at the beginning. And you can see that it's kind of come from a period of rapid warming. That's where the line is coming from down there. Um, so there was definitely a period of rapid warming there. And then we can see that the temperature is fluctuating quite a lot throughout that period in quite a dramatic way. And you can see that it correlates with these green and blue lines up here. But just sort of hold on to that for now, because we're going to come to explain that in a minute. 
If we go along the graph, we get down here to this real low point, which is the Permian mass extinction. This was the biggest mass extinction ever. And 96% of life died in that mass extinction. So almost everything died. It was not good. Um, so we think that that was caused, you know, it was definitely related to this big, massive temperature cooling. Um, and we think it was also related to huge global scale volcanism, which potentially put a lot of ash and debris in the atmosphere and contributed to this global cooling. So, yeah, that was bad. And then we see again, moving along a little bit further to the end of the orange line where we have the extinction of the dinosaurs um, at the end of the Cretaceous period, we see another kind of a bit of a drop towards cooler temperatures. And again, perhaps related to the meteorite and the debris in the atmosphere that came about as a result of, um, you know, during that period where the dinosaurs went extinct. So there's quite a lot of big climate events that we can see. And it seems that many of them are related to mass extinctions. There are smaller mass extinctions that happened as well. So actually there's one back here in the Ordovician that um, we haven't covered because it's not quite as big as the Permian one. But generally, big fluctuations during this big window of time, lots of dramatic catastrophic events happening alongside them. We then move forward into the green section of the graph um, and the whole green section of the graph onwards is called the Cenozoic era and that's what we're in now. You can see um, it starts off quite high and then kind of gradually gets lower throughout the entire time right down to the present over here. So you can see at the beginning there's a few kind of big climate events. We've got something here called the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum, which when there was essentially an oceanic methane burp, put loads of greenhouse gas into the atmosphere and it got a lot warmer. But then once that passed, we see this gradual decline all the way through to the modern era. And that's where all of these kind of red, green and blue lines at the top come into it. Because throughout the entire history of the Earth, it flip-flops between greenhouse states and ice house states. So those aren't to be confused with ice ages because those are a, a much smaller event. Greenhouse event stages of the Earth's existence are when there are no ice sheets at all. Nothing at the North Pole, nothing at the South Pole. Ice house stages are when there are ice sheets present at the North Pole or the South Pole or elsewhere. So we can see that about 34 million years ago, that's when the current ice house period starts. That's when the ice sheets on Antarctica started to form. So because they've been there since then, we have stayed in a continuous ice house state since. The greenhouse state obviously is present before those ice sheets form. And you can see the flip between ice house and greenhouse correlates with the massive ups and downs on the graph, the orange part of the graph for the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic. So these are clearly important things in the story of the Earth's climate. And mainly we need to remember that we are currently in the ice house state. We're not in the greenhouse state. We're in the cooler version right now. So we should have cool temperatures. So hang on to that for now, because we're going to hopefully move forward through time and try and explain how this is relevant to the current story of climate change. So like I said, there's a huge amount of Earth history. I, hopefully you got a bit of a glimpse of it from that massive graph on the last slide, but we don't have time to delve into all of it today. So we're going to sort of start two and a half million years ago and then move forward. So the last two and a half million years are a period called the Quaternary. So that's the one we're still in now. And it started about two and a half million years ago. It's split into two epochs called the Pleistocene and the Holocene. The Holocene has been about the last 12,000 years and the Pleistocene was everything before that. So like I said before, we are currently in that ice house state. And what, so that means we're not in the greenhouse state, we're in the ice house state. And within that, the Quaternary and the other parts of the Cenozoic have been characterized by big kind of fluctuations between glacial periods and interglacial periods, which we're going to cover on the next slide. The Quaternary in particular has had these big fluctuations in the ice sheets throughout it. So we've seen continental ice sheets expanding in ice ages and then shrinking when there aren't ice ages. Um, and those are all controlled by things called Milankovitch cycles, which we're going to cover on a later slide. They're the kind of background orbital forcing, like to do with the Earth's rotation around the sun that actually controls a lot of our climate. 
So, um, like I said, the Quaternary started um, with the glaciation of the Northern Hemisphere, and it's had this flip-flop between lots of ice and not much ice throughout it. I mentioned glacials and interglacials. So throughout um, the Quaternary and a bit further back as well, we've had a very consistent pattern of the Earth going between glacial times, where there's lots of ice around, and interglacial times, which are shorter warm periods between those really cold times. So you can see on the graphs here that they are very regular. The interglacials last about 10 to 20,000 years, and then they go into a glacial, which lasts about 80 to 90,000 years, and then shoots back up into an interglacial again. And that graph covers the last 400,000 years. So you can see that pattern has happened pretty consistently, obviously with some minor variation throughout um, every 100,000 years, you've had this cycle happen. The minor variations throughout are things called stadials and interstadials, but they're very sort of fine-tuned details that we don't need to worry too much about. We're focusing on this overall pattern of interglacial, glacial. So what we can see, actually, is that the when we go to the modern day on this graph, we're in an interglacial. That's what the Holocene has been. It's been a warmer period after the end of the Pleistocene, which was quite cold usually. And the interglacial has already existed for about 12,000 years. And in fact, it's been 15 to 16,000 years since the maximum of the previous glacial, which is kind of where the countdown starts from. So we're already kind of getting into territory where actually maybe the Earth needs would naturally start going back towards a glacial. So hold on to that thought because we're going to expand on it on the next slide. So I mentioned these guys before, the Milankovitch cycles. Easier way to describe them is orbital forcing. Milankovitch is just the guy who came up with it. And these, as I mentioned earlier, are all about the Earth's position in relation to the sun, because obviously, if we're closer to the sun or further away from the sun, it's going to massively dictate the temperatures on the surface of the planet. So there's kind of three parts to these cycles, the precession, the obliquity, and the eccentricity, easily, more easily known as the wobble, the tilt, and the shape. So the precession is about the wobble of the Earth as it spins on its axis. So if you imagine you are spinning a spinning top, as it spins around, it does begin to wobble. And the Earth does that as well as it's spinning on its axis. So the sort of natural wobble around our axis as we're spinning is something called precession. And as you can imagine, that wobble does have implications for how close different parts of the Earth are to the sun at different times of year. Next along, we have the obliquity or the tilt. So that's just about how slanted the Earth is on the axis, on its axis. So sometimes that axis is more vertical, sometimes it's more diagonal, and it moves in a relatively narrow range of degrees along that tilt plane. Again, that's going to have implications. It's going to mean if it's more tilted, the northern hemisphere in winter is going to be further away from the sun than usual. And then lastly, the eccentricity is just about the shape of the Earth's orbit around the sun. So we very sort of typically see an elliptical orbit. That's how we classically think of the Earth moving around the sun in a big oval shape. But actually, that shape squashes and stretches over hundreds of thousands of years. And sometimes it's more circular. Sometimes it's more of an ellipsoid shape. So again, going to mean, you know, it's going to have ramifications for how close the Earth is to the sun in the summer, in the winter, in the different seasons, how long those seasons are, how extreme those seasons are. So all of these things you can see are going to minutely affect the Earth's position in relation to the sun. And the combined effects of them have produced this 100 year cycle flip-flopping between glacials and interglacials. The three um, parts of the Milankovitch cycle all happen in their own cycles, but when you combine their rhythms, it produces those 100,000-year gla 100, year glacial cycles. So it just so happens that when you hit the 100,000-year mark, they come together in a set of conditions that causes the interglacial period, which lasts for about 10,000, 20,000 years. And then they've changed again so much that it pushes the earth back into a cooler state. So like we talked about before, our interglacial period has been going on for about 15,000 years or so already. And if we're following these 100,000 year cycles, which we should do because the earth is still doing the same thing in space, then we're at a point where the Earth should be moving back towards its um, glacial period. We should be moving away 
from these warmer conditions and moving back into sort of the typical ice age that we see with you know woolly mammoths and ice all over britain and the channel the channel between england and france not existing because there's just ice there instead of sea so we should be moving back towards the glacial period and the chain because the orbital forcing is pushing us that way so the only conclusion we can really draw is that there must be something else going on that means we're not following these natural patterns that have existed for hundreds of thousands of years so there's a really strong argument there for a human human influence and we're going to obviously come on to that more later but in the absence of any human interactions we would be following these natural cycles because that's just what the earth does and has been evidenced to do across huge periods of time so fast forwarding a little bit more into the Holocene. So that's, like I said before, it's about the last 12,000 years, 11.7 thousand years, if you'd rather be a bit more precise. Um, so we come out of a cool glacial period. We're preceded by a particularly cold stadial known as the Younger Dryas. So you can see on the graph there, it's quite a sharp increase in temperatures coming out of the cooler period. And by about 10,000 years ago, it starts to stabilize and we have the sort of Holocene climatic optimum is what it's called. And then the temperature of the Holocene stays relatively stable throughout that whole period. And the stability of that climate is very intrinsically linked with human civilization throughout that period. Because if you think about what was happening with human civilization 10,000 years ago, it's when we were just starting to sort of form proper societies, get going with agriculture in the Fertile Crescent and the stability of climate over the last 10,000 years is what has enabled us to grow and spread in the way we have and has enabled us to have such success. There's been a few blips as you can see along the line. In particular, there was a really cold event about 8.2 thousand 8 years ago where a big ice sheet over North America melted, a lot of fresh water influx into the ocean then messed with the global climate cycles. But generally very very stable and like i said it's had a big correlation with human growth throughout that period so if we fast forward to the end of that holocene period and we zoomed in to the last thousand years of that the graph begins to look a bit different so you know if you go back to the previous slide you can't see these fine tune differences and you can't see that big rise at the end apart from where the arrow is pointing to 2004 there Whereas when you zoom in a little bit further, you can see what's going on in the last 100,000 years. So this graph is known as the hockey stick. It's a very famous graph um, in climate science. And you know, since it was put together, it's really been a kind of linchpin in that argument for human caused climate change. So you can see all the wibbly wobbly colorful lines going along it are all of the reconstructed records from ice cores and biological indicators and all of those things we talked about earlier. And then the red line where it starts in about 1850 is when we transfer to the instrumental record of thermometers and rainfall meters and everything like that. So you can see there is, yeah, there's a little bit of noise and it is a little bit messy until it reaches that point. But even when the red line starts, it doesn't follow a different trend to the reconstruction. So that's nice. It gives us the faith that the reconstructions are actually doing their job and they are getting it right, although they do disagree with each other slightly in places. So like I said, we have the merging of the reconstructed record with the instrumental record. And the most obvious part of the graph is this massive shoot upwards from the Industrial Revolution onwards. Um, so we're going to come back to what was going on in that particular big jump upwards in temperatures, but it, it shows us a bit more of a, a in context picture because when you look at the bigger graphs like the big long massive one the temperature was moving all the way up and down that graph, it was doing all kinds of crazy things. But that's because the situation of the earth was so different back then the continents were in different places we were in a different place in relation to the globe the core of the earth was doing different things with the radiation whereas actually the last thousand years and even the last five thousand years of the holocene are much more comparable in terms of the continents are in the right place the earth's in the same place in relation to the sun it's a much more comparable situation for our modern climate and that's what we should be comparing it to we shouldn't be comparing it to what was happening when the dinosaurs were around it's a completely different kettle of fish if that makes sense so 
we're just going to cover a few of the little ups and downs in this graph because they're quite interesting to talk about. So you can see around here, there's a bit of a wobble. And a bit later on, there's a bit of a wobble as well around here. So we'll just cover those really quickly. So the first wobble is the medieval warm period, which is about 300 years of time, um, about 1,000 years ago, where temperatures globally were about one degree C warmer. Um, we have a lot of evidence of that in Europe, just because that's where there was a lot of civilization around that time that were keeping historical records. And um, the historical anecdotes we have, like grapes were being grown in England, Greenland was green, there was wheat being grown in Norway. So generally, probably the English climate was a bit more Mediterranean in nature. Um, and this period of warmth existed for a few hundred years and then went away again. And we'll cover why in a minute. The Little Ice Age was a little bit further on. That was another kind of 300 year window um, covering the Renaissance to the Victorian era. Um, again, not a big change. We had a one degree C change with the medieval period. And we've got 0 0.6 degree change um, with the Little Ice Age. But what we're really seeing here is that that context of what those numbers actually mean because in this little ice age, it's only changed by 0 0.6 degrees, but the Thames is freezing over. The whole Dutch fleet was locked in ice and Iceland nearly died because of crop failure. So the when we hear numbers today, when they're talking about one degree C change, 1.5, two, even four in some of the worst case scenarios, look at the context of what just one degree C change can do. It, you know, We certainly don't have a Mediterranean climate where we can grow grapes normally. And the Thames doesn't freeze over regularly to the point where you can have ice festivals out on it normally. So that really gives us some context, you know, within recent history of what relatively small changes in global temperatures can actually mean for us on the ground. So in terms of the causes of those things, there are a couple of natural short term climate forces as well. Um, the first of those is volcanism. So when volcanoes erupt, they can, if they're a particularly violent eruption, spew a huge amount of ash up into the stratosphere. And if they get, if there's too much of that high up in the atmosphere, they, these aerosol particles will reflect solar radiation back into space. The radiation then can't reach the surface of the earth and warm the earth. So it means you would get a sun drop in global temperatures. And that would last as long as it took for precipitation to wash all of that ash out of our atmosphere. So the more catastrophic the eruption, the longer that effect can go on for. Um, an example in recent time was the eruption of the Pin of Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991. So that happened and we saw we saw quite a rapid drop in temperatures for the Philippines and the kind of surrounding area, um, which was a direct result of that violent volcanic eruption. It resolved itself, like I said, in a few few kind of years time, once the precipitation had been able to wash all of that out of the atmosphere. But um, a great example in modern times of how volcanic eruptions can dictate climate over short term windows. And whilst Pinatubo was certainly a bad eruption, some of the so kind of catastrophic global scale volcanism that you might see um, as a result of a meteorite impact in the um, mass extinction of the dinosaurs can drag on a lot longer than 10 years. The other short term climate force is to do with solar variability. And we think this is probably the thing that was the cause of that medieval warm period and the little ice age, because actually there weren't really any big volcanic eruptions around that time that we think affected it. So this is all to do with um, the radiation produced by the sun. It just fluctuates over time, it varies. Sometimes it produces more radiation, sometimes there's more sunspots and sun flares, and that results in more radiation coming to the earth and making the earth hotter. It does work in 11 year cycles, but those move up and down throughout time. And you can see on the graph here, there was a kind of particularly warm bit during the medieval warm period, a particularly cold bit during the Little Ice Age. And it's got a bit warmer again from that now. So there is um, definitely probably, well, definitely a role for solar variability in causing those two previous events we talked about. So going back to that kind of dramatic rise at the end of the hockey stick graph, these graphs um, represent what we call the great acceleration, which is pretty much what happens to the planet 
from the Industrial Revolution onwards, and then in particular from 1950 onwards after the Second World War. So these graphs, none of them are actually, none of them are temperature. They are a huge range of things across natural sciences and economics and social sciences, but all of them are moving in the same direction. And that is real, real strong evidence for an intrinsic link, a causal link between all of these things. So we can see populations increasing, energy use is increasing, fertilizer use is increasing, um, international tourism is increasing, popula urban populations, dams, paper production, and all of those dramatic increases are happening at the same time as dramatic changes to our natural earth systems. Massive rise in carbon dioxide, rise in methane, rise in nitrous oxide, rise in ocean acidification, rise in fish capture, rise in tropical forest loss, rise in domesticated land. You know, so it's really irrefutable that there must be some relationship between all of this. There must be some causal links. And this is why scientists have now reached the conclusion that we have moved away from the Holocene and we're entering a new geological era where the earth systems are not dictated by natural things anymore. They're not dictated by the Milankovitch cycles or the solar forcing. They're dictated by humans and our actions on the planet. So what that means is have we arrived in a new epoch dubbed very aptly the Anthropocene, the epoch of man. So for many scientists, it's not really something that's up for debate. It is a bit of a buzzword. It's something that gets thrown around in newspaper articles, but it has been declared officially by top climate scientists as far back as 2016. You know, the scientific community are pretty, pretty set on this. They have tried to replicate what is happening right now using different models. And the only way you can replicate what is happening right now is by including humans in those models. The blue graph over here is if you only include natural things. And you can see actually that blue line is starting to decline in temperatures because we should be going back into that glacial period. The red graph includes humans. So you can see the only way that they've been able to recreate what's happening is by including humans. It's not something really that is up for debate apart from by you know a very very small amount of people so in terms of defining the anthropocene then in terms of all of the other geological eras they have to have something that defines exactly and very precisely where they start they have something called a golden spike or a, a gssp this global boundary section and point and it's basically something that happens all around the globe it happens all at the same time and it's really really unique so that you can spot exactly when that epoch change happens or that era change happens a great example of that is the end of the cretaceous period when all the dinosaurs die out what you have is a mass extinction of large groups of species dinosaurs obviously and you also have a huge spike in an element called iridium from the meteorite hitting the earth. So the fact that suddenly the fossil record disappears for a whole group of animals and the fact that you have a real spike in a very rare and unusual element is happening all around the globe and it's very, very unique and easily identifiable for people to say, right, that is the end of the Cretaceous period. It's very, very, uh, a very good example of that. Um, sometimes we have to use standard ages instead where um, we can't find these really specific signatures but it's very rare that those ages are used instead of these golden spikes in any kind of recent history anything after the cambrian explosion where the fossil record starts and we have more complex life happening we're always pretty much using these more definitive golden golden spikes to define changes in periods so there's a couple of different options for when the Anthropocene starts. There's quite a few different theories which are interesting to talk about. So we're going to talk about a few of them. And for each of them, we're going to think about actually, do they tick those boxes for a golden spike? Do they, do they work? So the first one is the early Anthropocene hypothesis proposed by a guy called Bill Rudderman. He posits that actually 
although lots of people talk about the industrial revolution as the beginning of some of these things we've been influencing the climate back as as far back as you know 7000 years 5000 years ago when we began to do larger scale agriculture so rice farming cattle based agriculture produces all sorts of methane agriculture itself stops um you know influences how much vegetation and trees there are on the land so influences carbon dioxide so he's arguing we've really been influencing it all the way from there onwards so that's when the anthropocene should start the problems are that there isn't really a dramatic change it's kind of a more gradual change and the fact that this, these kind of agricultural revolutions aren't happening all at the same time around the globe. There's some civilizations that don't really have them. There's some, certainly with the 5,000 year mark, which depends quite heavily on rice, not everyone's growing rice. That's only certain parts of the world that we're doing that. So it's not, it doesn't tick the box of global and it doesn't really tick the box of synchronous either. So that one is, a, it's an interesting idea, but it's been really kind of discounted by most people. The next one is something called the Orbis hypothesis. This is quite an interesting one and it has quite a lot of symbolism behind it. So it's saying 1610 should be the start because this is really the point where due to the colonization of the Americas by Europeans, we see this unique once, once you know, in a millennium or tens of millennium event where two groups of animals that have evolved completely separately, the animals in South America, for example, and the animals in Europe, are suddenly exchanged with each other, that people are sailing back and forth with them on ships, and they are then mixed up forevermore, and it is symbolic, you know, as the beginning of globalization, as we call it today, because things are, big, you know, it's the first time we mix all of these things all around the globe. Um, so in terms of how you would actually identify that, in the rock record, what they've suggested is a big drop in global CO2 to be identified in ice cores. So their argument is that when the Europeans came to colonize the Americas, there was a huge loss of life of Native American civilizations because of the disease that was brought over by the Europeans. So what that meant was all of these very heavily agricultural civilizations stopped doing agriculture because they were, they were dead. And forest was allowed to regenerate where they had previously been doing all that agriculture. So the regeneration of the forest led to a sharp global decline in CO2. And that's what they are suggesting is the marker for that one. So I quite like that one, actually. It works quite well for me. Um, the kind of original idea, like I mentioned before, was just the Industrial Revolution. That was the kind of initial one that was proposed as the beginning of the Anthropocene, the invention of the steam engine, the beginning of all these Victorian factories that put out loads of soot and metal pollution into the atmosphere. Um, but again, it suffers from similar problems. It hasn't, it's not globally synchronous. Yes, Europe and America are having their industrial revolution in the 1800s, but what about the rest of the world? They're not doing that. So it, it really isn't a global event. So that kind of just rules it out straight away. So although that was the kind of original thinking behind the Anthropocene, the actual theories have moved on a bit since then. The next one along um, chronologically is the Trinity test, which was the first detonation ever of a nuclear bomb by the Americans at the end of World War II. This is when they were testing for the bombs that they were going to later drop on Hiroshima. Um, so we because it's the first one ever, there's a global fallout of radioactive material that was obviously an unnatural event and creates a signal around the globe for that. So that's an option there. It's quite a symbolic one, obviously, of the destructive capability of humans. Um, I guess quite pessimistic from that point of view. But um, yeah, it's an option. It's an interesting one, though people have argued that the kind of global fallout happens not immediately, but over the period of about 20 years as more nuclear warheads get detonated by the Americans at the end of World War II. So it could work, but there might be better candidates. The next one along is closely linked to that great acceleration in 1950. So we get to the end of the Second World War. We have the Green Revolution, where lots of underdeveloped countries begin to you know, start their own industrial revolutions, have start to produce things industrially, industrially, produce a lot more pollution, burn a lot more fossil fuels. So we have a global layer of something called SCP. SCP is a particle that's only produced 
by combusting fossil fuels. It's not something that occurs naturally. So the big increase of this in around 1950 has been suggested as well as another marker for the Anthropocene to start. So that's quite a popular one. There aren't really many drawbacks with that one because it's, it's very morphologically distinct. It doesn't happen naturally and it is happening around the globe all at once. The last one I think is symbolic in actually quite a nice way. So the last one that's been suggested that I'm gonna cover is about the atomic testing peak in the Cold War. So right up until the Cuban Missile Crisis where they signed the end of nuclear testing treaty, there was lots and lots and lots of nuclear and atomic weapons being developed. And as a result of that, there was lots and lots of radionuclides around the world. So when they sign the treaty and stop production of them, you see a big drop off in all of those radioactive materials. So that is there as a marker around the globe because it was happening in the Americas, it was happening in the Soviet Union, it was happening elsewhere around the world as well. And this one is symbolic. Yes, it is symbolic of you know destructive technology, but it's also symbolic of the human ability to actually stop that and do something about it like they did with the end of nuclear testing treaty. So. That one's quite a nice one. <laughs> so sort of just to finish off, I think, you know, we are pretty conclusive that we've moved into this Anthropocene period. The Anthropocene Working Group, which is a group of scientists who are in charge of defining it properly, basically, said that they were going to finally define that in 2021. I'm not sure if that's going to happen now because of COVID and everything, but it is supposed to be this year that the start date is finally finished debating and gets officially approved. So what we're seeing with, you know, we've talked about the Anthropocene, we're having unprecedented climate change and mass extinctions we've mentioned before are very intrinsically linked with catastrophic climate events. And scientists are arguing really, we are moving into a sixth, sixth mass extinction at the moment. So there's only been five ever and they've all been linked to really catastrophic events. The sixth one is our doing pretty much. And you can see the black line at the back, the bottom there is the background level. That's the normal amount of extinction that should be happening. And you can see the lines for all of these different vertebrate groups that have just very dramatically increased since the 1800s. And we, you know, they're still increasing and we are still losing huge amounts of these species. So regardless of the start date, you know, the, the sixth mass extinction is just an extra piece of evidence, an extra nail in the coffin that we really are in this Anthropocene period. We have really truly replaced natural forces as the main driving force behind our climate and our environment. We're having these unprecedented impacts that cannot be explained by natural phenomenon. They can only be explained by what we ourselves are doing. So that is a fairly miserable note to finish on. <laughs> But there is hope. It's not too late to stop all this, especially now that Trump is gone. It's through the work of organizations like the Wildlife Trust and other you know, organizations fighting for nature and fighting for climate change, we can be begin to rectify some of these damage, particularly through things like nature-based solutions, which lots of wildlife trusts are championing, championing at the moment. And we're gonna, we have that capability to bring Earth back towards its natural state. So, I hope that wasn't too depressing. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And let me stop sharing my screen and hand over to Emma and Sue. Wow, Ben, that um, you certainly gave us an awful lot of food for thought. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and hand over to Emma. Obviously, there's, there were some questions that came in, and I think um, there'll probably be more as we continue talking. So I'm going to hand over to Emma, and she can ask those questions right ben <laughs> are you ready yeah um i'm going to do my very best to um say these with my with, with the right way and please excuse me if i don't say them with the correct um words but hopefully uh, you'll understand what i mean so martin has asked a couple of questions the first one um is evolution burst seems to favor high temperatures and usually much higher CO2, for example, the Cambrian explosion, Paleocene, Eocene, TM, etc. I hope you understand what yeah. that means. Any thoughts on that one, Ben, please? So, yeah, you know, it's absolutely true because 
higher temperatures in a very crude biological sense mean that organisms have more energy so there is more potential for things like mutation and evolution and things like that and a lot of the higher temperature periods also coincide with um higher oxygen levels in the atmosphere which can also be a driver of evolutionary change so i think yeah absolutely martin is definitely right evolutionary change is linked to higher temperatures and i think it really does come down to the fact that organisms do have more energy and particles are just a, that much more chaotic because of the higher temperatures um that would be my guess anyway i hope it's along those lines um but um probably yeah definitely something really interesting to look up i think i mean you can actually see that even in modern times with the biodiversity gradients ac across the globe because if you look at the tropical latitudes there is so much more biodiversity there because of the higher temperatures and again it's linked to the energy um, created by those higher temperatures okay brilliant thank you ben um hopefully martin um that answered your first question so ben this question is coming this was the martin's second question um so let me read it very carefully for you some is it pliocene is that the right how you pronounce it three million years ago maps um, show the temperature was much higher, but only in highest latitudes, plus degree, 10 degrees Celsius. Um, equatorial regions show little or no increase in temperature. Is this true and why? And the second part to the question is, is this a guide for current models? For example, um, vineyards in Iceland, but little temperature change in the Amazon. Yeah, <laughs> that, that is a good question. Have you question. got that? <laughs> yes, I, I can. I, I can see it. I open okay. the thing, so I can see. Oh, it. good, good. Um, so there's a few few bits to that. I must admit, I'm not overly familiar with Pliocene maps, but I do know that um, the Pliocene and the Eocene, I think, are considered by climate scientists to be some of the best analogs for our modern situation in terms of the position of continents and things like that. So, I, I think for the second part of your question, it may be extremely relevant for current models um, of how things are going to change. But um, I, can only, I can only postulate that the temperature changes being that much different is just an artifact of the, the composition of the continents and the oceanic cycles at that point in time. Um, the equatorial regions, perhaps, um, maybe even due to the Milankovitch cycles, were not experiencing those extreme variations uh, with certain parts of the Milankovitch cycles, like the um, the tilt and the um, the e eccentricity. They affect the the extreme latitudes much more than they affect the equatorial latitudes. So it could be an artifact of that. Um, like I said, it could be an artifact of continental positioning. I know, f for example, when you know, three million years ago, obviously the continents have moved around a bit since then, but when they moved around to open things up like the Drake Passage or shut the Panama Canal, that's um, that caused big changes as well because it, it opens or blocks new oceanic currents. And the oceanic currents that are going around um, the thermohaline circulation are really, really, really important control for controlling the uh, global climate. So sorry that was a bit rambly, Martin. I hope that answered your question to some extent but definitely a really interesting one and perhaps one to do a bit of Googling. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, Caroline would like you to um, ask, uh, is asking this question, is global plastic use considered a possible golden spike? Mm, good question. Yeah, scientists have looked into that actually and um, they they have considered it. But I think I think from what I recall, the kind of argument against it was that they weren't sure how long that that would exist for, if that makes sense, because these golden spikes need to exist forever. So it needs to be something that's fossilized in the rock, or it needs to be something that is chemically part of the rock or the ice. Whereas the plastic, obviously plastic takes a really long time to biodegrade, but it does eventually get there. So I think there were concerns that it, the longevity of the plastic as a golden spike might not really be up to scratch compared to some of the other things, if that makes sense. Okay, great, thank you. Um, then we have um, a couple a question from Peter. 
um, wanting to know how much temperature rise can plants tolerate? For example, is this going to affect food production anytime soon? It really, really depends on the species of plant um, and the kind of conditions surrounding it. So some plants are much more tolerant to big temperature fluctuations, probably such as my house plants that haven't died. Um, whereas other things are very, very, you know, picky about what they like the same, the same way animals work. So some plants and already we've seen some plants will and have go extinct as a result of climate change others will thrive in the new conditions that are created, especially as um, things migrate further north as their range expands because the temperatures are changing. Um, yeah, so it is something that really, really depends on the species and if there is room for them to, to move. So some things as conditions change might try to move further north or further in terms of altitude, further up to reach more comparable conditions to what they want to be living in. So if they have the opportunity to do that, because there is a mountain or is there, there is continuous land without an ocean in the way, they can migrate and continue to exist, albeit in a slightly different place. But where we really see the extinctions come into it is where there's nowhere for them to go. They can't go any higher up, they can't go any further north, or there's just too much competition from invasive species. Okay, yeah, that's uh, quite a topical debate, I would think, that one. Um, Peter also just um, wanted to double check whether you'd made a typo or something on your last slide, Ben, because he's, he's asking the question, you've got, um, what are vertebrates and other vertebrates? Was that a typo or can you no, explain that? No, no, please? no. Um, I, I haven't got the slide open now, have I? But when you look at it, hopefully it will be clear. What that's supposed to represent is that vertebrates is absolutely every vertebrate, whereas the other vertebrates line is just the other vertebrates that haven't got their own line. So mammals and birds have their own line, and then other vertebrates would then be like fish and reptiles and amphibians, whereas then the vertebrates line is everything. Okay, hopefully, hopefully, Peter, that that's clear, <laughs> clear for you. It's always it's always good to double check these things so Definitely. that we know uh, we know exactly what you're talking about, Ben. Okay, um, Mel would like you to answer this question, please. Do you think that people misunderstand the relevance of one or two degree temperature increase when the global temp ranges from minus fifty to plus fifty anyway? Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I was really trying to hammer home when we were talking about the Little Ice Age and the medieval warm period that people don't people don't get it. People don't get the context of what that actually means. And so when we can look at a past event and say, OK, well, this was only 0.5 degrees different. And look how different England was because of that. Or look how different the rest of Europe was because of that. It gives us some context and some grounding of what that means. Um, whereas, you know, when we just hear, oh, one degree, that's fine you know, people don't quite get it. And like you say, our sort of day-to-day -day temperatures are constantly going up and down. And in some parts of the world, they're massive. And some parts of the world is very cold. But it's the, it's the point that it's a global average relative to a set level. So it's the fact that, yes, okay, England was really cold last week and it's really warm next week. But on average across the entire year, continuously it's getting warmer and warmer and warmer by small increments, but they are consistent increments. And those will eventually add up to one degrees, two degrees, hopefully not, but maybe four degrees. Yeah, and that's when we might have uh, a few more problems rising. Thank you very much for that one. Um, thank you for the question, Mel. Um, we have a question for you from Bill. Um, will thermal change lead to more evolution in virus levels we are seeing currently, for i.e. more frequent pandemics? Very topical. Um, yes, um, maybe, maybe. I don't know exactly in relation to COVID, but disease and climate change is certainly an area that has a lot of attention in science. Partially, uh, it comes from increased mutations in things, and partially it comes from the greater range that vectors for disease such as mosquitoes have. So it's quite a common one we hear that mosquitoes are going to keep moving further north and they're eventually going to bring the malaria with them into Europe. So it's things like that where vectors of disease such as mosquitoes and other nasty flies 
typically exist in tropical regions. As climates warm, those, those guys will be able to move further north, further south, and they will bring those diseases with them. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for that one. Okay. Um, right. We have uh, P Peter's um, doesn't want to agree with you, Ben. On, uh, he's <laughs> okay. afraid. That's well. I know. It's, I, we do love a debate here on Surrey Wildlife Trust. Um, um, Peter's saying that almost all beneficial photosynthesis is from leaf temperatures between ten degrees Celsius and thirty degrees Celsius, maximum thirty six. Um, it is already going to impact crop yields. So do you have a have a return comment on that one, Ben? Yeah, I, I think, sorry, I think I missed the part of your first question about food production. I didn't actually cover that because I absolutely would not disagree with you that it is already impacting crop yields and will continue to impact crop yields because obviously crop plants, like you say, aren't these extremophiles that I was kind of referring to before that exist in very specific niches. So yes, if we're thinking about food production, it is, like you say, it is already impacted and their range of, like you say, acceptable living temperatures is quite defined. Yes, exactly. Um, okay, hopefully, well, we'll see. We'll see if we have another question, <laughs> a return hit. Uh, it's like a game of tennis, isn't it? Um, back from Peter. Um, right, we've got a couple more questions coming in. Um, just sort of, I've got two more questions for you, Ben, and we'll perhaps then we'll say if, if anybody else has got a question, if you can get those popped into the Q&A session now, so sort of last, last, last calling for um, questions, please. Um, this is from iPad 2, so I'm not quite sure who this is from, Ben. So um, um, the question is, the graph of temperature over the last million years shows interglacials last for relatively short periods. Without human input um, of carbon dioxide, it seems we would soon maybe be entering another ice age, which would be equally problematic for human civilization. And what do you think? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, exactly right. Like I said during the talk, we are reaching the point where we would go back into a glacial period or an ice age. And yes, that would be annoying for humans, but I, the, the natural systems of the Earth don't really care about that. They, they would be doing what they wanted to be doing anyway. And yes, it would be problematic, but humans have survived many, many glacials already. We've existed as a species for 2 million years, and there have been many glacials during that time. If now more than ever, we are well equipped to ex survive another glacial because of all the technological advancements of the last 10,000 years. So yes, it would be problematic, but I don't think we'd all die. And I think it wouldn't, it wouldn't be happening just yet anyway. It would be happening within getting really, really ice agey within a few thousand years time. So again, even room for even more technological advancement to mean that we would just adapt and overcome such an event rather than going extinct or anything like that. And it wouldn't be our cause either, would it? No, so, not necessarily. Anyway, I won't, I won't get involved in this conversation. <laughs> right. Um, the last question, Martin's come back to us with, a, with our final question um, of the evening, if nobody else has got any more questions to come in. And would like to know, will CO2 or methane be the main contributor to global warming in the future? We can easily reduce CO2 if only countries talked together. I know. Um, so that, that's a really interesting one, actually, because CO2, methane, along with a few other things, are greenhouse gases. And um, all greenhouse gases have a kind of figure associated them uh, with them, which is their radiative forcing, which basically means how bad are they for global warming if they're in the atmosphere? Methane is actually much worse than carbon dioxide if it's in the atmosphere. It has a much higher radiative forcing. But the sheer volume of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere like trumps methane completely in terms of the actual impact it's having right now. So CO2 is the lesser lesser of two evils in terms of the actual effect of an individual CO2 molecule. So it, it, yes, if we can reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, it would come down quite a lot, but we do really have to be careful of the methane because the radiative forcing is that much stronger from it. So if we 
the, the methane, yes, it comes from agriculture, but uh, the dangerous stuff is going to probably come from um, permafrost melting in like Siberia and places like that that unveil peat bogs, which will then release lots of previously trapped methane into the atmosphere. So that's kind of, <laughs> methane is the one to be careful of, but carbon dioxide is the one we can do something about. <laughs> Okay, brilliant. Okay, well, that, Ben, I think is the last of our um, Q&A questions. I know, Sue, you've been busy typing away, answering lots of um, questions, lots of things in the chat as well. So I shall pass back over to you to, uh, to finish that off. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've just been going through lots and lots of chat, thanking you enormously for such a wealth of information. We had a couple of teachers saying that uh, they're going to be taking this back to their classrooms, which is wonderful. But we did have a lot of questions asking about um, how we can they can get access to this recording. So just so that you know, the recording of this entire presentation will be made available probably by next week on our website, as all of our webinars are. So if you want to go back and review, because wow, there's a lot of information in there. So you need to go back and look at some of those slides. It will all be there available for you. Um, Ben, I really wanted to thank you for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, Emma, thanks for being my co-host. But most of all, thank you all very much for coming tonight. Um, and particularly those of you who are members. Um, we really appreciate your support because without your continued support of the Surrey Wildlife Trust, we couldn't put on events like this. Um, you will be seeing, keep an eye on our uh, website. There'll be many more events, both webinar format, um, as well as our coffee mornings. And we have a whole host of uh, online uh, adult learning courses, and hopefully soon we'll be having the walks and talks again. So, um, so there's lots available and we really look forward to seeing you again. So thank you very much for joining us tonight and um, have a good evening. Bye, Bye now. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye.